you are going to pick that uh, something up today yes okay uh, i have to give you the card yeah afterwards maybe i forgot to bring it so you can come up stairs and collect it tell me that now yeah good om sahana bhavatu sahana bhunaktu सह वीर कर्वाह तेजस्वीतमस्तुमाषावह शातिशा दि उपनिषद इट से इन एडिशन टू द भाषा Upanishad itself has certain, you know, pedagogical tools that it uses for ease of understanding. For this peculiar understanding, for solving this peculiar problem that almost doesn't exist, but kind of, you know, almost is there, is not there. It's in between. The problem is in between. The knower is in between, and. this whole in between thing it dismisses it dismisses this whole in between reality not by terming it as non existent but by showing its dependence dependence on that which is ultimately you so the upanishad also has the methodologies and uh, what are some things if we look at all the upanishads we see some common methodologies one of them and from this we know what this study is like one of them is that it is always starting with a little story most of the time there is a context there is a akhyayika a story in the mundaka upanishad that we are studying what is the story there is a parampara is described first starting with brahma ji and then what shaunaka who was a great giver had done a lot of fire rituals and wondered what is this leading to is this the ends or is this the means and so saying approached a teacher for that knowledge knowing that one thing knowing which everything is known approached a teacher for that knowledge now very interesting because you see there also you have the link between the first portion and the second portion of the vedas the upanishad first the, these akhyayikas these stories serve as a bridge for the student who is who is cross but not yet crossed over to the other side who knows i'm cross i'm angry i'm upset but has not crossed over to the second portion of the veda which we have seen in detail what the differences are so this student has not crossed over yet because still the moorings are there and the vasana the habitual patterns are all there about identifying as a doer and uh, wondering where all this doing is leading what is the fruits of doing is knowledge a fruit of doing all these things are still hazy in the person's mind and the upanishad the, the the mother beautifully mothers here by building a bridge between the first and the second portion of the vedas in fact the veda as the mother already does that in the first portion and even in the first portion of the vedas says that yagnen gnanen tapasa vividishanti brahmana ha i mean it, there are so many statements that say that uh, like all the work that you are doing is preparation to know this so the first portion of the veda builds half the bridge already but in case you have missed it the upanishad also comes over to this side of the veda briefly to assure and guide the student safely over to the side of being from doing you graduate from doing to being so is the orientation towards doing has not yet gone so usually the stories act the stories have a number of you know wonderful uh, lot of significance lot of importance for the stories the stories act as a bridge the upanishad is frequently a bridge 
The stories often show someone who is doing a lot of rituals or who has done a lot of rituals. Or the show, stories show someone who says, I want the best ritual for the best effect, for the best thing that I should have. And then the teacher will start teaching self-knowledge and says, this is the Jnana Yajna, Jnana Meva Yajna, this is what you need. And so you, you have various kinds of stories and the stories do the important, you know, the salient and much needed um, job of of bridging the relevance of the first portion of the Veda to the second and what are how do they stand in relationship to the each other the first portion is the means the second portion is the end the first portion is the preparation for the second portion which is the knowledge so the stories establish this connection unequivocally that is the first thing the stories accomplish the stories also entertain the jiva who is bored a jaded jiva who comes to the Upanishad wants to be entertained you know because it's not easy to leave all the malls and balls and then come here you know sitting at 8 o'clock in the morning what are you getting you know and uh, so therefore it is not easy to do that and the Upanishad values the person's commitment the person's viveka commitment Vairagya, renunciation from all other pursuits and knows that in the beginning Shrotra Buddhi Prarochanaya as uh, um, Adi Shankara explains in another Upanishad that in order to liven up the buddhi of the Shrota, the hearer to entertain the person a little bit these stories serve as some kind of a wonderful way to pay attention. If the Upanishad were to say all this that is here is you, some sounds will start coming. What sounds? Snoring sounds from the classroom. <laughs> Nobody will listen. Why will they listen? Because the person, that readiness is also not there. That is what we mean by the Upanishad even though it talks about how a prepared mind only can get this knowledge very nicely is also preparing the mind for the knowledge while feeding it the, the, the knowledge. So the second thing about the stories is that they, they perform the, they have the unique position of keeping this person interested, alive, entertained enough till the person plugs into the teaching and can let go of the need for the story. Like see where we are in the Mundaka Upanishad now, nobody is interested. What happened to Shaunaka? <laughs> now is, there, are, is the teacher having a coffee break or are they doing something? Nobody is interested. Now we are in, into understanding Brahman. So the story itself is like a bridge for the mind which is mired in samsara, in mires, mired in various distractions, means and ends. So the story is offered as a prize distraction to lure the student and to keep the person there. Not even to lure because one has already arrived but to keep the person entertained so that the person doesn't feel like this is a dry thing because they are used to only one form of entertainment which is contact high with anatma. Yeah. So this is the whole thing. And the, another very important function of the story the stories in the Upanishad is that they depersonalize ignorance and all its broods because sometimes it's too close for comfort. If the Upanishad were to say, Oh ye useless ignorant person, know that you are, thou art Brahman. If the Upanishad were to say that, the ego is a very subtle thing, its resistance is even subtler. Person switches off. Yeah doesn't want to listen because why already feels bad that I am I'm, uh, ignorant, I am not knowledgeable, I am crazy and I lack all these things. And the Upanishad is also telling that right from the beginning. You are ignorant, you are suffering from a sense of lack because you don't know yourself. Okay, okay, I know I don't my, know myself but don't make this harder. So because of that 
you know, there is people are sensitive about things being pointed out. And it's much easier to listen to one Nachiketa going to Lord Yama, to Shaunaka going to Angiras, to Maitreyi approaching Yagyamalkya. And so it depersonalizes this. This whole issue of self-ignorance is seen as, is deliberately belonging to someone else so that I can look at it objectively without having that judgment be a deterrent in the knowledge. Very beautiful. That is the third function of the story or the place of the story. Number four, very interesting and slightly paradoxical to number three is that this depersonalization allows me to identify with various characters in the story and therefore connect to the teaching that way. Either I identify or they become role models that I wish I can become like, you know. People can identify very easily with Shaunaka, all this life of doing. What has it prepared me for? What is that one thing? You know, so you can identify with Shaunaka. You can't quite identify with Nachiketa because he <coughs> surpasses in everything. But you see him as a wonder boy, a role model to which you aspire to be like him in terms of Viveka and Vairagya. So the stories have that uh, impact of being able to identify with various characters and aspects in the story so that it does not stop you from, you know, from seeing this as unreachable, from something that is beyond your capacity. It does not do that. So these are the functions or the place of the story in the Upanishads. So a lot of Upanishads, we are looking at Upanishads in general. A lot of them begin with stories. Some may not. And even if we look into the stories, they all have some common features of the stories. What are the common features of the stories, for example? Typically student and yeah. teacher. Typically they have at least two people. Story means, dialogue means you have to have two people. So they, they typically have at least two people, sometimes more. Sometimes the whole classroom is described in the Kena Upanishad. In the Prashna Upanishad, there are six students and one teacher. And so typically they feature student and teacher and thereby the story also gives, now the function of the story is to give a clue as to how the knowledge is gained. From the story itself we know how the knowledge should be gained. It's not gained by sitting at home and eating bananas. It is not gained by doing yajnas. It is not gained by reading the book. Nobody is reading the Upanishad at home in any of these stories. Oh, Shweta Ketu, what are you doing? Oh, I'm just reading the Chandogya Upanishads. <laughs> he doesn't say that. Yeah. So, the, the story itself shows, illumines the, the nature of the pursuit and what is needed to stop pursuing the self. What is needed to culminate, for the culmination of this pursuit into knowledge, into phala, into the fruit of, you know, all knowingness and not suffering from a sense of want, what is it that is needed? So it is that interaction with the teacher, this is very evident, all the stories talk about that. And then one more thing, what does the story do? It talks about who goes to the teacher. The one who identifies as the student alone calls, you know, for a teacher. First it's an inner search then one searches outside and so here also we know who should approach who teacher should not hand out leaflets at the street corner <laughs> come one come all to the katho upanishad ball you know we we shouldn't do that that's not our uh, you know that's not what we have to do then what do we have to do what are we supposed to do we, you know this we are not supposed to do anything the student has to come and beg for the knowledge. And we see this in the Bhagavad Gita, which is like an Upanishad. We see this in all the Upanishads. 
And only when the student asks, the teacher responds. So this is another wonderful thing, is that the teacher does not force the knowledge on someone, even though it may be true, it may be real, it may be the only thing to know. The teacher does not force the knowledge on one that is not ready for this. The Gita says very clearly, Na buddhi bhedam janayet ajnaninam karma sanginam. Don't disturb the buddhi of people who don't know the truth and yet are only interested in action. Don't disturb them. If they say, I want to sit and do bhajans, encourage them. If they say, I want to sit and just open a restaurant, encourage them. If they say, I want to do modeling, encourage them. Yeah. Let them do whatever they are, they are wanting because nothing is opposed to Atma. Atma is, her, itself is not opposed to ignorance. So nothing is a waste. Through modeling, one will learn to model the, the, the truth of the self. Through, through all these things, may, maybe not this life, maybe ten lives of modeling and film star and uh, then later on one will come to this knowledge and start to have the daring to star in their own life, you see. So everybody has their own karmic trajectory and if the readiness, you cannot push the readiness. This is what the Upanishad shows in her kindness. The stories show that this readiness has to come from the student approaching the teacher. So there is a freedom, there is not an enslavement that the teacher is looking for sign-ups, you know, and then putting everyone to work. This is what people's, what is that negative uh, fantasies about ashrams are. <laughs> that karma yoga means work without pay. You do things for free. And who is it benefiting? Benefiting the teacher. Because after all, ashram belongs to teacher. So the teacher is taking out work from the student without giving them anything. This is the negative fantasy of ashrams. Of students in various ashrams. That's why a number of parents get worried mm -hmm. when the student wants to go to an ashram. Oh, they're going to exploit you. Mm -hmm. As though the workforce is not enough for that. <laughs> The capitalist workforce in which you are stuck, every day you have to do something or the other to stand out a little bit, otherwise it spits you out. You can't take leave uh, unless they tell you and uh, supposedly you have the freedom to work from home, but uh, when you work from home, you work harder than when you are at the office, which is the only reason they allow it. Work from home means they can call you at any time or the day or night and they can first uh, email you and then chase the email, first they will leave you an email, then chase the email with a voicemail and then send you a text to make sure you check your voicemail. This is the freedom to work from home, supposedly. So that all they don't see, but the parents get extremely worried if the offspring joins an ashram. And we have a very funny word, inmate. <laughs> yeah. And where else do you use the word inmate? <laughs> ah, incarceration places where people can go in, you can, they can check in, but they cannot check out. You know, and then what? And what do they do there? They work for no money, correct? Because they, they keep making license plate and clothes and because uh, a lot of these uh, um, capitalist, um, what is that, these factories are located in prisons. Gap and all these other things. So they keep making all these things and they are paid a pittance. They are not given the money right then. When they are released, they, it'll, it's put in some account. They paid pennies, no minimum wage, no rights. You give up all your rights and that's when you become an inmate. Mm -hmm. Yeah. The mate is a euphemism. Yeah, you are not friends to it. Nobody is your friend there. If you are not beaten up, you can call that person a friend if the person doesn't beat you up. That's all it is. There is no friend in a prison situation. But mate means many people are there. That's all it is. There's no other meaning for the word friend there. There's no place. And so too, the people's negative fantasy of a place of learning called ashram is like this. That you, you give up all your rights because you have to listen to the big dude and the guru called guru. And then what? You don't have any expressivity. You don't have anything. And you have to do exactly like the teacher says. And you have lost all your freedom. That's why I'm an inmate of the ashram, people say this. And this makes everyone around the person, whether they are the friends or the parents, worried because here you are being exploited, you are not, you're not 
having a say over your own life. You know, this is the, 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 the wrong idea that people get. But this is not what the Upanishad reveals as the sacred learning relationship between the teacher and the student. It's a relationship of sanctity. It's not a relationship of control. That's why the voluntary nature of the student going to the teacher is emphasized again and again in every story, in every Upanishad. It's not that, that the teacher seeks the person out. In fact, if you are sought out by someone, even though it's the, like a romantic, spiritual, romantic fantasy of everyone, if somebody says, I want to be your guru, run miles away from them. Really. The altar of surrender, which the guru is seen to be, must not need that surrender. That is what the, that is why it works. Yeah, the, the need is all one way. The attachment is one way. The fear is one way. It's all one way. And that's why it works. Because like I said in the last lecture, the, 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 the teacher does not participate in the counter transference. Allows the transference to come up, allows it to die down on its own. May help along with a few lectures or whatever it is. But if you don't, if you participate in the transference, even the slightest bit, it becomes a dushita, a kind of a relationship that is fraught with uh, the feeling of obligation. You scratch my back, I scratch your back. That's not what is going on here. But then what about seva without money? Well, you know, Two things. The seva is for who? Hmm. That you have to understand. The seva is not for the teacher. The teacher does not want you. The teacher in fact allows the seva so that you have a place to grow. That is what the teacher allows. Even in the Upanishad, you see the student bringing water for the teacher and bringing firewood for the teacher and serving the wife of the teacher and then uh, you know feeding the teacher and bringing milk to the teacher all these things you see in the stories of the Upanishad and they are all what they are all to show that the one who is benefiting the first of all the service is voluntary the student is what is the one who says I would like to serve I want to do that or the student at least shows himself or herself available for service because sometimes they may not know what to do but they they show themselves that I'm, I'm available please you know bank on me when you need something or when the ashram needs something so they show that they are their readiness to serve is there or the service is suggested by the student and then what the service blesses the student to be in a place of learning. That's what the service does. What does the service do? It reduces strong preferences. Because in the time of doing the service, you know, you could be doing so many other things. Who has time to do one more thing? No one. Everyone is busy. But you make the time. Because when you make the time and do something prayerfully, respectfully, out of the desire to be respectful to the teacher and the teaching then it blesses the service blesses you that's all it is you, you tap into the student taps into something which cannot be accessed without the service so the service is an integral part but it is voluntary and nobody is forced to serve nobody is forced to serve and even though its benefits are emphasized so this is what the Upanishad tells. This is what all the stories function to tell. How to be in right relationship to the knowledge. How to be in right relationship to the teaching. How to be in right relationship to oneself, to the teacher. This is what the Upanishads unfold even as, the, as they are unfolding the knowledge. So therefore there is no enslaving. There is no inmate situation or loss of freedom. There may be a certain loss of freedom in the sense of you can't get up at one o'clock in the afternoon. <laughs> yeah, you would like to. If you were at home, you would never get up from bed. But uh, here, there is a certain discipline. Yeah, a physical discipline is emphasized. 
correct time to wake up, correct time, a time of worship, a time of play, a time of rest, a time of duty, seva, a time of bhajans, light-hearted, you know, whatever, um, engagement, a time of satsang, a time to sleep, a time to eat. And since everybody is doing it together, there is growth in that discipline because when you provide the mind a structure, which is very missing in this, in this country, I find this is where the block comes. You have this false feeling, I can get up whenever I want, I can do whatever I want. But really speaking, you are enslaved by your desires. It's not that you can do whatever you want. You are doing whatever all these tendencies within yourself are wanting you to do. Your, your mind is enslaved by all the desires. So here the structure paradoxically frees the mind to not be a slave to the desires. So that's why there is a structure. It's not that so that somebody can rebel against it. P people often do. But the structures are very ancient. And if they have worked for, to, to make other people in our ancestry into sages, why not you? So saints have been born as a result of these structures. So there is something which is very beautiful about the structure. It's not that it's like, oh, it's just like a prison because the bell rings before meal time and, you know, there is a certain time for the meal time, there is a certain time to eat and sleep and then I have lost my freedom. You have lost your so-called freedom of tending and attending always to be a sentry of the desires. You know, whenever the desire walked in, you say, hail desire, you salute the desire. You keep bringing in the desires, there is no... You know, you are a sentry that has been bribed by the desires. That's what it is. And therefore, even though the door is closed, you keep showing the desire various ways to get into the citadel called the head. And this is what the structure teaches you how to be a good sentry. How to be a good vigilant person who is in charge of what they desire. And the structure also gives the structure of the teaching, the structure of the day, gives a certain um, form to the whole pursuit, gives it a certain form, which is safe, because there is safety in structure, so that you are not distracted and you just go, don't go overboard. So you learn to live within a certain structure, and that structure blesses by giving a certain character or the formation to the day, to the year, to the time of study so that inside that structure I can prosper. Like even when a small shoot comes up, you have to put a little thing around it to protect. You put a little lattice around the structure so that wild animals, cars, feet don't trample on this small little precious, you know, nascent plant which is likened to the nascent understanding. This understanding is just growing, but then if you throw it in the world of desires, without any structure, do what you want, go where you want, it is, you know, it is trampled by the hooves of desire. This is what it is. So the nascent understanding is protected by the structures, so that it has a place to grow, become so firm, that not even the strongest wind can shake it. That is the whole idea, that is what is called Nishtha, Nitaram Sthitihi. So you see there is no inmate, there is no enslavement, there is no, you know, free work without pay. That's not what this is about. That is not at all what this is about. So what? So this is about the understanding that this structure is not for me, the structure is for those habitual patterns, so that the, the structures serve to contain the habitual patterns, which are a deterrent to my understanding. This is beautiful. So the Upanishad itself has a structure. And the Upanishad teaches about what these structures are. And Another point of proof that everything is so voluntary and there is no enslavement, so the teacher-student relationship is not based on enslavement, 
is the importance of questions. Mm. Yeah. Questions are not only asked, but they are encouraged. In fact, the conversation between the student and the teacher is always in the form of a dialogue, and a special dialogue. And so the student is, is encouraged to talk, encouraged to ask questions, because this is not a belief-based tradition. Ishvara is not a matter of belief. It's a matter for understanding the truth of who I am. So therefore, it is not some... This is the different... The teaching is different from a sermon. Whether it's on the mound or it is, you know, it is on a flat surface to deliver, doesn't matter. A sermon means you just have to believe that there is a God, that you have to believe, that you are you were born in sin and that that belief is going to save you. That someone died for your sins, even though you were not even there to have those sins, were all based are all based on belief. You can't question. If you question, you are seen as a heretic. The question itself is seen as blasphemous. It's blasphemy. Meaning, you are you, in the ancient times at least. If you ask such questions, you were immediately excommunicated. And today, it came in the paper that. There is one forward-thinking uh, Jesuit priest in India. His name is Amaladas. And uh, he is, you know, he has been doing a lot of interfaith work and apparently has come to the notice of the Vatican. Even though the Vatican is now headed by a very progressive Pope in a number of respects. But this they don't like about him, you know. They don't like a number of things about him. Because he said something, he wrote apparently, I have not read the article, I would like to write, uh, read it, but he has been refused permission to publish it. He apparently wrote an article that has become the seat of a number of controversies and the article, I don't know what it's called, but it's about whether the theology, Christian theology in India has necessarily to be different because of its heritage. Yeah, that is something like the title. Like, is there an Indian theology? Can there be an Indian Christian theology and still be Christian? And what will that Christianity look like? Because it is in, in Mother India, which is the home to this eclectic experience. And you see, this is what I'm talking about, enslavement. I mean, he's such a senior Jesuit priest, probably head some kind of diocese or something. And he is not, he has to take permission to publish. He's not publishing in the name of the Vatican, neither are they publishing his book. He's publishing it by himself, his own money. But still he has to take permission or they can withdraw the permission and say that you don't, you, your views have to be in line with the Catholic views. Otherwise, you don't have a place here to speak on our behalf. So he is under fire for that. And now, apparently they've recalled him to the Vatican and where he has to sit and uh, talk and have various conversations and to show that he is faithful to the church. This is ridiculous. Mm -hmm. This is ridiculous. Why does it only have to look? Why only that version is the, uh, the ultimate? And if it's all belief-based, you know, this is not, we are not dealing, I mean, science cannot be belief based. You cannot say there is gravity, but maybe there is not any gravity. You cannot say that. Correct? So, but if it's belief based, then it can be anything. But still, there is such a great, uh, what's its name, mm, relationship of heresy and the, the individual person, you know, relating to this religion has to be very afraid of being called a heretic even if you are a senior person and so then what now we have to see this very very carefully that here this is more of a socratic method of teaching if you have to put a method on it in fact socrates must have got it from the upanishad only so there is a certain dialogue and if you look in the world, there are many forms of dialogues, you know. And the ancient sages 
classified the dialogues into four kinds. One is just a discussion. Oh, what movie is playing in the theatres? And somebody responds, this is the movie that's playing. You want to go see that? No, 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 I think I want to go see the other one. Oh, what's that about? This is called Vada. Two friends deciding how to spend an evening. Oh, shall we go to this cafe? No, 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 that one's better. Why? Why do you say that? Okay, let's go to this one this time. Next time we'll go to the one of your choice. This is called Vada. Between two equals, people of, who relate uh, to each other, this is called Vada. Then we have a special dialogue between the student and the teacher. The student, is not that the student doesn't talk. The student asks the questions, talks and may comment on something which the teacher said to increase his or her understanding but gives the benefit of doubt to the teacher and listens when the teacher talks with an open mind. It is called Samvada, like the conversation between Krishna and Arjuna. Arjuna asks a lot of questions. In fact, every chapter, uh, practically every chapter begins with a question, you know, with a few exceptions. And sometimes he will ask in the middle also. And so therefore, it's not that the questions are not encouraged. Questions are encouraged. But along with that, how to listen to the answer and how to ask the question. The asking of the question is not trying to trap the teacher or to test the teacher's knowledge, but to increase one's own understanding. So that is what is also shown by the Upanishad, Samvada. So it's, the, the, it's always in the form of a Samvada between student and teacher. There are two other and should, should never be used forms of dialogue. And one of them is called Jalpa. Jalpa means two people just at cross purposes. You know, one says blue, the other one says red. And one says green, the other one says yellow. There is no connection. They are not really being able to talk. It's like some of, in the early days of the interfaith movement, it was like that. Mm -hmm. Every person from every religion would just come and talk about their own religion and, and, and go away. But here, you know, that's not the point. You know, so this jalpa means you are not able to see the other point, person's point of view because you are just so busy trying to put forth your own point of view. So it really sounds like an argument rather than an agreement or a consensus. Finally, we have a fourth kind of dialogue or conversation which is called vitanda. Vitanda means you, uh, you, you, what you said is wrong because you said it. Yeah. So I t personalize everything and I say that you said it, therefore it's wrong. I'm not even looking at what you said. I'm letting over my dislike of the person overshadow what they may have to say. So really speaking, the, the Upanishad has, you know, showcases only Samvada, the, the, the special dialogue and the most sacred kind of dialogue between the student and the teacher. So every Upanishad is in the form of a dialogue. Sometimes the teacher is named and the student is named. Like where? What is one example? Mm. Kata Upanishad. You have Nachiketa, you have Yama. Student is named, teacher is named. Sometimes none of them are named, like Kena Upanishad. You know there are students, you know there are teachers. There is a teacher. There are many students, a classroom full of them, it's, it's implied. But the teacher or the student's name you don't know, but still it's a dialogue. And sometimes you have the Upanishad like a Daitari Upanishad, where there is no mention of student or teacher, but you know somebody is listening and somebody is talking. Why? Because there is a question. Aho vidvanamul lokam pretya kaschanagachati. That, that pulling of the e is, is, the, is to show question. That plutaswara prashnarthe for the sake of showing the question. Oh, revered sir, it's impl implied. You know, where does the person go after dropping the body? Yeah. Once you know this knowledge, what happens to the person? And this is what the whole question is. 
So the presence of the question is a nod to the methodology of the Upanishad with the student-teacher dialogue. So then, so you have named students, unnamed students, overt student-teacher situation, covert student-teacher situations, but definitely all that the Upanishad features, showcases, is the student, the teacher, the methodology. Now, one more thing about the Upanishads is, is the methodology itself. Number of things to say about it. The teaching tradition, the methodologies that are deployed are very, very unique to knowing the truth of oneself. First is called the, the methodology of dismissing that which the I is not. And why is that? Because the I is so much mixed up in the not I. Correct? So therefore, na iti, na iti, not this, not this. So we have a number of negative statements, not statements full of negativity, <laughs> but negative statements as in not affirming what, uh, you know, what the, uh, as in affirming what the I is not by negative statements like ashabdam, asparsham, agandham, arasam, meaning it's not an object of, you know, sight, sound, taste, touch, negating the five, you know, mula pramanas or inference, all the means of knowledge to find out the truth of I. So this is, this is one methodology. And then we have affirmative sentences. Asango hi ayam purushaha aham brahmasmi to show that that oneness, to reaffirm that oneness. So there are affirmative statements, there are na iti and then iti, that is one, you know, kind of a thing. And then there is apavada, aropa and uh, adhyaropa and apavada. So you, you, you first look at everything as Bhagavan, you know, you see that. First you make a difference, this is I and not I, and then what? And then everything is I, everything is Ishvara, Isha Vasya Midam Sarvam. Adhyaropa Apavada. And Adhyaropa means you see the Jagat with all its names and forms. And then the names and forms are negated. What is left? Bhagavan, I. That's all is left. So it's... And another name for this method in English is the law of invariable concomitance. And what is concomitance means when A is, B is. But when you see that when, you know, B is not, what still is? A still is. That's why the three states of experience follows this methodology. Sleep is, I am. Waking is, I am. Then what? Dreaming is, I am. So what is common in all this? I. I. So sleeper, waker, dreamer, who sustains? I. So if I is not there, is sleep there? Can sleep exist without the I? No. Can the dreamer exist without the I? No. Can the waker exist without the I? No. So this is what is called Adhyaropa Apavada. So you look at the situation, you see what is, what is that invariably that is there. What is invariable in dreaming, sleeping and waking? It's the I. This is a beautiful way. So all the Upanishads, you know, when you see we are just showcasing the, the general ways in which the Upanishad deploys various methodologies to bring home this knowledge. So you see this a lot in the Katha Upanishad. In any Upanishad, you can, you can find Adhyaropa and Apavada being done. Uh, Apavada means negating the non-invariable, which has su superimposed itself, you know, on the invariable. And when you negate the, that which is not, that which is always variable when you negate, then the invariable comes out on its own. That which stays, which is not capable of being negated is what is called the variable, I mean the invariable, I. And then 
the Upanishad also gives some mechanisms or methods to, to internalize this, assimilate this knowledge if the reason why it is not being assimilated is due to some blocks, fears, etc. So how to clear the mind through upasana, through various sadhanas, practices such as meditation, how to fix the mind because when you meditate you, do, you are not distracted. So after meditation also with practice you are not distracted while listening to the class. The class itself is made into a meditation. So this is what is taught to prepare the mind to, to have a single minded focus, singleness and a focus. This is what the Upanishad also has, Upasana. And then it also has ways, it also tells you what you need to do to prepare the mind in a different way. Because the mind, you know, the two problems with the mind is distraction, vikshepa, and then laya. Laya means what? Sleeping or just becoming, getting into a tamasic state. This is what is the problem with the mind. So the meditation controls both of those things. Gives the mind a single-minded, uh, you know, way, focus. Focuses the mind. But the problem is also not with focus. The other problem with the mind is that it's full of ragas and dveshas. So to drop the ragas and dveshas, you need service and you need to actually be doing something so that the raga dveshas don't completely, what's its name, overpower the, the, the person, the student. And so often when the student comes to the teaching, in the Upanishads, the teacher gives a key to the cow's table. <laughs> yeah. Why? So that the student can become stable. After say stable seva, you become stable enough for the knowledge. And this is what happened. Indra who thought I am the king of the universe, I am the, the head of the one who lets people into heaven. And what did he do? He went to Prajapati. He said, I want to learn this thing. But unfortunately, he was accompanied by the king of Asuras, Virochana. Then what happened? Prajapati gave him the key of the stables. And here he was wearing all white, thinking that <laughs> he's going to sit for the <laughs> Upanishad class. He's a Brahmachari and he's going to sit in front of the teacher. And he was told to wallow in cow dung, make <laughs> pat a cake, pat a cow dung cake put it on the wall to dry and then collect them in the evening, bring them for fuel. He, you know, this is what he was told to do. And he said, I didn't bring gloves. I didn't bring my apron. Never mind. Just get into the stable. Ah, he grumbled, he mumbled, he fumbled. And then he said, all right, for how long? You know, when is the next class? After 33 years. <laughs> And then what? Then he dressed up again, put vibhuti, you know, got to, had a shower, got into white clothes, sat in front of the teacher and the class was shorter than the opening prayer. Class was one word, one syllable long. The teacher chanting the opening prayer said, Da! Huh? What? Can I ask a question? Yes. When? At the next class. When is that? After 33 years. 33 years. So how many? 66 years. He did this three times. So 99 years it took for Indra to prepare for the knowledge. And since he is a, a celestial, 99 years is not a long time. But still it is, it is a very sobering thought. That he was dispatched to the stables by the teacher repeatedly. Because his mind was not prepared. And what is the source of not non-preparation? Too many ragas and dveshas, which are not managed. Too many preferences, too many desires which manage you. So therefore the Upanishad also does this trick of preparing the mind by recommending, by showing what happened to Indra. I mean such a big person. 
and so who is this person who then one uh, is of course constrained to think i don't even have half the punya that indra does and he is a celestial so look at all the this seva i how much seva i must need to do in order to prepare my mind so i i i see the gravity of the situation i see the real uh, reality of of how that non preparation can interfere with my assimilation of the knowledge so this is what the upanishads have to uh, offer and they are like various flower gardens which specialize in certain things so if all of them are the same why to why do i have to study all of them you don't one is enough but then why do these others exist because they are like various grasses where they go that's why the cow always yearns for the pa- pasture next door maybe the grass is greener on the other side maybe that has a few more daisies it's also because the mindset of the student is different somebody will feel like only if indra got this knowledge then only i'll get this knowledge so they will be attracted to the chandogya upanishad some other person will be like shweta ketu extremely intelligent and has no time for this teaching and then somebody else might be like nachiketa somebody else might have you know might be averse to having male gurus somebody might might be saying only if it's a woman i will study somebody says only if it's a man i will study so that's why there are various kinds of teachers there are teachers who only teach there are teachers like lord yama who keep making jokes there are teachers who uh, who teach in various ways so that it's all designed to work in tandem and mount an attack on this on this measly little mind that is stuck to only certain ways of knowing and and the, the upanishads mount a concerted you know multi you know pronged attack so that the mind just disarms itself and learns to listen so wherever there is any corner of doubt fear resistance by showing these various stories the person is kept interested and kept in a place of knowing and so that all the habitual patterns do not bother so this is how the upanishad reveals the teaching that's why there are many upanishads and then we generally study ishakena katha prashna mundaka mandukya tittirihi aittareyam cha chandogyam brihadaranya kastada these are the 10 upanishads what are they isha kena katha mundaka mandukya five taittiriya called tittirihi here tittiri then aittareya chandogya brihadaranyaka these are the 10 that are traditionally studied because they have commentaries but that doesn't mean others should not be stu- you know study uh, studied in fact we have studied ganapati atharva shishra upanishad we have studied what else you know kaivalya upanishad which are not among the 10 we are studying shvetashvatara upanishad which is not among the 10 but still they all have to say the same thing so the idea is if you study these 10 then you can teach anything then you can study anything for yourself you don't need the help of the commentary after a while so the commentary helps you to uh, is a guide you know is like the gps to the upanishad it tells you where there are cafes it tells you where to stop it tells you how to uh, uh, how to read a particular sentence it t- tells you how to read the road signs it tells you to watch out if there are any dangers in in wrong interpretation so that you won't be lost so the the bhashya is the gps to the upanishad and so the upanishads where are they i told you they are at the end of the veda so how are they they are all distributed at the end of every veda there are upanishads with a few exceptions sometimes they are in the middle like the isha vasya upanishad and then every veda begins with what is called a shanti mantra what is a shanti mantra a prayer for the removal of obstacles because the person who is coming to the learning has is full of obstacles where everybody has obstacles and then the papa comes out in various ways and the papa comes out means what there are so many difficulties at all levels that is the papa can't sit in class that's one papa coming out difficult karmas come out 
can sit but can't concentrate another papa or can sit and concentrate but it's a very noisy place you know it's right next to a lumber yard and you you hear the chainsaw all the time you know this is all you know or some some droning sound comes or somebody is repairing something or mowing the lawn next door all these are various obstacles that can take away the the joy of learning can take away the effectivity the effectiveness of the learning and so therefore to to we start everything with a prayer the upanishad starts with a prayer the whole veda starts with a prayer called shanti mantra where one prays for freedom from obstacles so every veda has a shanti mantra and uh, rig veda there is a shanti mantra vang me manasi pratishthita mano me vach pratishthitam that is the shanti mantra of the rig veda may my walk be in my 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 speech be powered by my mind meaning may i be mindful in speech this is all a way of honing in and preparing clearing and opening for the learning then the the samaveda has its own shanti mantra apyayanta mamanga nivak pranas chakshu shrotra matho balam indriyani cha sarvani maham brahmani ra kuryam may i never go away from brahman as though it's possible but mentally you can mama brahmani ra karoth may i never feel a sense of rejection from bhagavan from this teaching and all these things this is the samaveda then atharva veda what is the shanti mantra for atharva veda Om Bhadram Karne Vishrani Yama Deva We have chanted that many times And Mundaka Upanishad we know So when you chant the mantra you know which Upanishad it belongs to And then the Yajur Veda is divided into two Shukla and Krishna Shukla Yajur Veda we have the Brihadaranyaka Upanishad And uh, Isha Vasi Upanishad also And then that is the Shanti Mantra for that is Purna Madaha Purna Medam and then the shanti mantra for the krishna yajur veda there are two recensions the krishna yajur veda which is prevalent in south india shukla yajur veda in north india so for the krishna yajur veda it is what we chant every day sahana bhavatu and in fact both the shanti mantras we chant from the yajur veda because this lineage belongs to the yajur veda we what we have here is a yajur veda lineage so we chant one shanti mantra in the beginning and purnamada another shanti mantra also belonging to the yajur veda at the end so so every you know thing and so this kathopanishad is from the krishna yajur veda so which mantra will you chant sahana, sahana vavatu which is itself a beautiful mantra short very effective sa what is the meaning of this shanti mantra sa sah means that being who is in charge of everything ishvara may that ishvara now you and me dual avatu protect may this being protect us both even though there may be many students in the classroom only that the, the teacher student relationship is emphasized because the teacher has a one on one relationship with each student so it's always in the dual now sah that sah indeed may bhagwan protect us both why because if the teacher and the student are protected then the knowledge transmission is protected the mind of the transmitter and the transmitted to are protected then sah now bhunaktu so not just the minds but the bodies also may be nourished and protected bhunaktu same same uh, you know verb as nourish and uh, here the whole thing is this that may we may you and i may us both have what it takes to be protected physically to be nurtured because this body is meant for the knowledge for the teaching sa here it's saha together viryam karava bahai together may we accomplish great things third line 
meaning may this what is the great thing to accomplish here gain self knowledge that's the greatest thing and perhaps here the great thing is that the student becomes a teacher in his or her own right that is a really great thing so sahaviryam karavavahe may we accomplish great things together meaning may we contribute to the furtherance of the brilliance of this lineage tejasvinau adhitam astu may our learning be brilliant yours and mine meaning may it lead to freedom from samsara then the final line is very interesting ma vidvishavahai may you and i and literally means never hate one another mm. why will the teacher hate a student it's not possible at all it's not possible for the teacher of brahma vidya who has spent years learning this if they have learnt it properly there is no hatred in the heart it's not possible for a teacher to hate the student and if the student is the one who has approached the teacher why will the student hate the teacher student also will not hate the teacher here this dwish is a master stroke to 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 bring in all the psychological problems of transference and projection that is what uh, is saying ma let there not be any misunderstanding so misunderstanding of the words uh, of the teacher on part of the student in which can be a great deterrent to the knowledge and the misunderstanding of the intentions of the teacher on part of the student and also misunderstanding the transference you know in the sense that seeing in the teacher a long lost father or a long lost mother and not being aware of it yeah if you're aware of it it's okay you know but not being aware of it and therefore you know assuming that the teacher doesn't like you assuming that the teacher is not happy with you you know these are all problems of the unconscious and so they have to be taken as such rather than putting it on the teacher and so here it says ma vid vishavahe may this teaching be free of all the 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 ugly underbelly of transference and wrong projections on part of the student and may the words of the teacher never be misunderstood may they may they always be understood and then finally it says om shantihi 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 shanti even though it is uh, defined as peace what is really peace freedom from disturbance and it is repeated three times here because we uh, assign three sources of ashanti one is from acts of god so to speak over which i have no say you know earthquake tsunami etc if it comes in the way of the learning i have no say over it, over that so shanti from you know this whole adhi daivika problems adhi daivika is acts that are centered obstacles that are centered on unexplainable forces such as god ishvara karma whatever it is then you have adhi bhautika shanti things that disturb you in the environment in the immediate environment of the classroom you are paying good attention somebody walked in that you knew then you don't like and suddenly why why they are coming to this class what can they learn from here this class is not for them and then by, by saying that you are making it not for you that's what you are doing because you have missed what has come so this is or being disturbed by the seating arrangement by something or the other too hot too cold all this is called adhi bhautika ashanti ashanti that is centered on the environment and then finally ashanti that is centered on the self on one self alone one's mind one's thoughts one's desires adhyatmika ashanti and really speaking it's all, if if this one is taken care of the other two don't matter because what control do you have over acts of god none what control do you have over your surroundings none what control do you have if you come into class little late and your favorite chair is taken none <laughs> so you have to deal with it so really speaking if i let go of this thread of this this ashanti my personal ashanti 
then that is the only one where I can exercise some, you know, say and I let go of this and then what happens as a result? You know, I'm free. So this is what the prayer is. Om Shanti 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 and therefore please let there not be a disturbance. This is a very beautiful prayer. And uh, so tomorrow we will start with the text. Om Purnamada Purnamidam Purnat Purnamudachyate Purnasya Purnamadaya Purnameva Vashishyate Om Shanti 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 Harihi Om Shri Guru Bhyo Namaha Harihi Om